Welcome back to Virtual School Assembly. Today our guest is Daryl Fordyce. Daryl's a professional soccer player uh, for 16 years now. He started out with Port Portsmouth FC in the English Premier League and has played in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, Canada, and the US. Uh, he's currently with Valor FC in the Canadian Premier League. And we talked a little bit before recording today. Um, I'm really excited, Daryl, to talk to you, not just about your experience with soccer, but kind of the changes that have happened in the last 15 years uh, in your, your personal life with where you were, were raised and, and now as a father with a, a son of your own. I'm excited to dig into that a little bit. But first, I guess, just welcome to the show. We're glad to have you here. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so we, we've had a, a number of soccer players or, or footballers on, on the show uh, thus far, but most of them were from America. So excited to dig into kind of your background um, from Northern Ireland. Now, I know you grew up in Belfast in kind of a, a, a difficult situation, I guess, as far as the, the political climate there. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think there are some parallels between what you were experiencing you know, 30 years ago and what we're experiencing right now in the United States. Can So can you just talk about kind of the divisions there religiously that were going on? Yeah, for sure. So uh, growing up in Belfast, you know, it's a, it was a divided city. It still is to an extent. Um, on one side, you have uh, Catholics and on the other side is Protestants. Um, I would be on the Protestant side and I grew up in a, in a tough Protestant area, you know, where a lot of the There'd be a lot of rioting and things like that that would go on. But, you know, I, I grew up in, um, obviously, you have the terrorist organ organizations like the, the IRA, Irish Republican Army, you know, so there would be bombs going off. You would hear the bombs going off. Um, you know, every other day, somebody was getting killed. Um, and as a, as a kid, you didn't really understand what it was. Right. But growing up in a Protestant area, um, it was basically just, I, I can give my uh, view on it, was for me, I was told that Catholics were the enemy, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, I grew up as a, as a kid, um, and that was in my mind the whole time. If, if I seen someone uh, in, a, in a Celtic football jersey, they're the enemy because they're, they're Catholic, and in the Protestants, we were Rangers. Um, but it wasn't until I... I turned 14 and I get selected for the Belfast schools team. Uh -huh. And whenever you, whenever you get selected, obviously half the squad would have been Catholic and half it would have been Protestant. So that would have been the first time I ever worked with uh, the Catholic side and, and players because I was in a Protestant school. And there was very, there weren't many integrated schools. Uh, right. There were some, but there weren't many. You know, and then when I remember the first training session, getting in, showing the locker room, and as the as the training sessions went on, you got to know other people from the other side. Uh, in the change room, it, it became obvious that, hey, we're just the same people here. Right. So I, I've been led to believe that, like you guys are bad, and from their point of view, they were led to believe that, like we were bad. Right. I'm like. What is the whole point in this? And obviously, it, it, it's all a political side, and it goes back a few centuries, I guess, um, right. which is obviously out of all our hands. But we were there. We just wanted to play soccer. Uh, and, and it was right there and then I realized that, you know, we're, we're all just the same. Right. Um, we, just, we just wanted to be soccer players. Was it hard to come to that realization, um, you know, because you were raised a certain way? Was it hard initially when you were put on that team did you did you hate the your teammates? Did you have certain expectations with them, or was it pretty quickly that you were able to come together as a team? Yeah, we came together pretty quickly. Um, that was, again, that was the first time we ever experienced um, cross community mm -hmm. with Protestants and Catholics coming together, and that was my first experience personally. Uh, but I just remember turning up, and it was obviously the trials. We had to go to the trials before we actually. We, the team was selected mm -hmm. and it wasn't until the team was selected you got to know other players personally right um, but again we, we would go training and uh, there were still the riding going on and the differences in, in this different sides political sides you know all the conflict was still going on 
So we would go training. We're training with each other, having a great laugh. And then once you finish training, you were going back home. And next minute, like where I was from, you could watch all the ratting, fighting with each other. And, and, and I'm there as a 14, 15-year-old kid saying, hey, I've just been training with the guys that you're fighting with. Right. And then the Catholics from the other side would have been saying the same thing. Right. You know, right. so for me, it was, it just didn't really, from, from that moment on, it didn't really make sense to me. I'm like, why would I want to get caught up in this? Like, this is, it's just not good. It's not good for anybody. Right. Um, but again, it was, uh, my dad just always said to me, you know, focus on your, focus on your game. If you want to be a professional, you can't get distracted um, with anything. Just go to school, work hard in school. And then once you finish your class, if, if you go training, go and work hard at training. If you, because I wanted to be a, a professional soccer player. Right. That was my dream. Yeah, you know, so, so it's interesting looking back. So for you, this was about 20 years ago at the turn of the century. So around 2000, 2001 is when this was happening for you. And it, it's interesting to look because in the United States right now, obviously we have writing going on and, and there's a lot of social inequalities that is being discussed right now in the media. And, and it's a real big deal here right now. But I think a lot of people, especially from my generation, we thought, oh, we never knew that race was an issue. We didn't know this was a problem. We didn't know that there was all this discrimination. There's a lot of ignorance that's going on. And so I think as a country right now, this is a time of understanding where we're trying to see other sides and see other perspectives. As a boy, as a 14-year-old, when you saw this in, in Ireland, um, was there a national push to try to get to know other people? Or is this just something that was forced upon you because you were on the soccer club? No, it's just straight into the soccer team. Um, but again, what they started to do was, I think they started to implement, um, if someone owns a business, it had you had to hire your employees and it had to be sort of half and half, half Catholic, half Protestant, uh, and then a fraction of uh, other Europeans or people from America, things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, And then they started to put in more integrated schools um, so they, it meant that people would go to an integrated school and become friends with Catholics and Protestants. Protestants and uh, you know, I was speaking. I was back home in Belfast over Christmas there, and I was speaking to my niece who just started uh, high school, and uh, she's obviously a Protestant as as well. And she she goes to Starbucks with a lot of her Catholic friends and things, uh, which is good. Um, but from whenever I was there, you couldn't really go to coffee, it was just, you're in either the football pitch, but now you're able to sort of go into, because you sort of have, the area is Catholic and then one area is Protestant. Right. And you weren't, you couldn't go across, mm -hmm. but now you, you sort of can, um, certain places. But again, it, from an outside point of view, I can, I can see a lot of things happening in, in your country. Um, but from, from my point of view is, you know, you're either a good person or you're not a good person, um, one, or, one or the other. So I, I guess you, you pick one or the other. And for me, a good person, he looks at other people. Uh, what can they do? What can you do for that other person? Uh, how, how do you treat people that are below you or, you know, in positions that, that are below you or whether it's financially or, uh, wherever you live, what type of house you live in, what clothes you wear, you know, um, for me, a good person will always take care of the people that are below them and, and give them a helping hand up and, and try and help them along their life, you know, so right. for me, it's either you pick the good side or you, or you, you be a bad person. <laughs> yeah, There's well, I think one else. of the, one of the challenges that we're going through right now is obviously everyone thinks they're a good person and they want to do good things. But I think um, what we're seeing is there's a lot of ignorance. I mean, honestly, I, I have to admit that I had no idea that this was going on in Ireland recently, that there was this big division because I'm ignorant. I, I haven't studied Irish history. I don't have a lot of friends from Ireland. And so a lot of it is just coming to an understanding of who people are and where they're coming from. And part of the reason we go to school is to learn those things. 
but there's also, I mean, that's why we have this channel, right? Is so we can understand different people, different point of views. And I think that goes a long way. Now, I want to circle back to this, but let's talk a little bit about soccer for a while. Yeah. Um, so I know from a very early age, you, so when you were seven, you played on the nine and under club uh, in, in Belfast. And it, this was a, a big deal because what was it, 86 people that ended up playing at, at an elite level. Talk a little bit about um, that, that team and how you got selected for it and, and what happened with that. Yeah, so... Uh, when I was seven, I was playing for the Boys Brigade, the Boys, Boys Brigade, which is like the Scouts, I would uh -huh. say. Um, I was playing in a soccer match, and I just remember this guy at the side of the pitch with a cap on. After the game, he, he approached the, our leader of the team mm -hmm. and asked for my contact details. And obviously, back then, you didn't have social media, mobile phones, right. nothing like that. It was, it was a home telephone, which was plugged into the wall. Um, but you, you knew your phone number off by heart right. um, and it was only six numbers so I was able to get past my phone number on so he could speak to my parents and he obviously phoned my dad and my dad explained like he, he's a guy he runs a he runs a soccer team and I went up to some trials but uh, it only started at under nine so you had to be basically nine to play for them I was only seven at the time but uh, the guy, Joe Kincaid, who, like, he ended up producing 86 professional players in, right. in 15 years from our club. Wow. Um, you know, so the work that he put in, and then obviously finding out afterwards, the work that he put in behind the scenes as well. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, I signed for that team, and it wasn't, I think, I played up until under 11, and then... They held me at under 11 for three years, so I would play my proper age. Right. So I stayed at under 11 for three years. Huh. When, when boys were starting to get, because I was still really small. Right. And boys were starting to get just a bit too big for me. Um, but again, joking kid, we found out that he would go to Holland, to Ajax in uh, Amsterdam, and learn from their, their academy there, huh. and bring everything back to Belfast. And all we focused on was our skills, tricks, ball mastery, um, our technique of the ball. And, you know, he, he felt it as a personal player. If he improved that, everything else will take care of itself, which it did. Right. And, you know, so we, we've produced, we still have, there's still players in the Premier League that came through the, the club. Um, and that's how it started out. It was just a, a guy with a cap at the side of the pitch seeing me play. That's cool. Well, so for me, one of the cool things about this story is when you talk about your coach, um, one of the things that he did is he was a lifelong learner. So he was going off and looking at what other teams were doing, making notes of the best things, and then incorporating that and bringing that back. And that's what resulted in so many of you playing professionally and setting that foundation at a really young age. I mean, we're looking uh, under 11, that's phenomenal that though sure, sure. you could identify talent at that young age and then cultivate that talent so that they could go on to play professionally. I think that's a good lesson for the students watching this is analyze the game, see what other people are doing well and incorporate that. And we have to talk about your professional career because that's something that you have done. You've played for 16 years at the professional level. And the reason you've been able to last so long is because you've been able to evolve with the game. You've been able to study others. And, and we talked a lot about this a little bit before recording, but one of your great strengths now is that you can analyze play a lot faster than you could years ago. And so even though you're a little older, you have some advantages because you can kind of see what's going on. Let's talk about how you have learned and adapted over the last 15, 16 years. Yeah, so whenever, whenever you're younger, um, you don't really think about things too much. You just go and do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, can, you obviously can, can caught, get caught up in a lot of, uh, in, in whatever environment. And as it's quite known in Ireland, Irish people love some, they love to the drink. They love to the drink beers and alcohol. And, right. and, and that's just our, that's our culture. So as a professional, any professional sports person, it's very, very easy to get caught up in that sort of culture. Mm -hmm. So my dad always taught me to stay away from alcohol and 
uh, smoking and things like that if I wanted to be a professional. Uh, but again, it's, it's staying fit. It was looking after, my or looking after my own personal body, eating the right foods, sleeping properly, going to bed at the right time, um, reading books. You know, I've read, I'm not even, a, I don't even like reading, but I know that reading the books, the benefits of reading books is tremendous. Um, and then, you know, reading things like uh, about the British cycling team. Now, people might wonder, what has British cycling got to do with professional soccer? And whenever they done, they done excellent at the Olympics, and they won so many gold medals at the Olympics, and they've produced Bradley Wiggins and you know, great cyclists like that, um, whereas they weren't very good at it beforehand. And it was just down to the uh, marginal gains right. type thing where, you know, if you, if you can improve, improve a little bit in each area and do that continuously, you know, over the course of a year, you know, if, if you improve 1% each day, right. that, all those percentages add up over the year. And if you do that continuously for a number of years, you know, you're, you're, you're dramatically yeah, you know, improved. And, You've invested in yourself. You've, you've made a huge difference. Uh, and then looking into other things, for me, I'm always looking at what, what can be improved on. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously yoga. I get into yoga um, maybe at 23, 24. So it was 10 years ago. And yoga, you know, now it's, now it's you know, it, it's there. Men do yoga. Athletes do yoga. But 10 years ago, it was a woman's thing. Right. It was seen as only women do yoga, you know, so I would, I would actually do yoga in the house, buy a DVD and do it in the house where no one can see me <laughs> just to try it out. And then I realized that, you know, this is actually benefiting my, uh, my game, my performance. It's helping my performance. It's helped me recover less injuries. It's making my body stronger. Um, and then get into, you know, the gym work, speaking to professional personal trainers and, and how they sort of, how, how I can train based on my game. But again, it, it's not just being good on the, on the pitch with the ball. There's a lot of things that go into it. And, and if you can figure, figure out how to improve yourself in each different area, you know, you're, you're going to be a good, you're going to be good at no matter what you do. Right. Uh, but again, it, you can't just do everything all at once. You have to sort of analyze it, um, look at different areas and then, sort of focus on one thing, tick that off, then focus on the next thing, tick that off, focus on the next thing, tick that off. And, you know, and, and it's a process. Right. Uh, you can't just wake up one, one morning, get out of bed and say, hey, I'm as good as Cristiano Ronaldo. It doesn't, you got to put the hours in, right. you got to work. Um, and again, eat the right foods, sleep, um, have a good social life. Um, obviously, the friends, the, the friends that you have, um, because growing up in school, I could have went, be, become friends with the cool kids who were, you know, a little bit misbehaving. You know, the, the kids that sit at the back of the bus and, and heard abuse of people. Uh, that's the way it is in Ireland. Or I could have sat at the front of the bus with the other friends that were more respectful, which I did choose. Um, you know, so a lot of the time, uh, for me personally, I did get bullied a little bit in school a couple of times, but because I was good at soccer, they, I sort of got a buy, I got a pass because I was good at soccer. And it does happen, but again, it's, it's whatever you want to do, like focus on what you want to do, what you enjoy, uh, figure out how you, you can be better at it. And again, for me, I, I just wanted to be a, a professional soccer player. And if you enjoy, if, if that's your job, for me, I, I haven't worked a day in my life. <laughs> right. You know, well, but that's not really true. Not really I, true. I, get, I get what you're saying. You love what you do, yeah. but you also work incredibly hard. And I want to talk about that for a minute because we're in an interesting period right now where with COVID this last year, a lot of people have had their hopes and dreams, things they've worked toward, and they've had to put it on hold. They've had to, you know, people who didn't graduate last year or not physically, they didn't get to have the experiences they were planning on having because we quarantined and we're at home. 
and you have some experience with that because just as recently as 2018 with Edmonton, things didn't go perfectly for you and you ended up not playing during that year. You, you were put on hold. Now, so what I'm curious about is while you were waiting for your opportunity to get back and to do the game that you love and to do what you're capable of, how did you make the most of that year while you were waiting and seeing how things develop? How, how did you make that into a positive experience? Yeah, well, uh, whenever I was in Edmonton, we played in the North American Soccer League, which uh, folded at the end of 2017. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was three days after my wife found out she was pregnant um, and she had just started a new job. So in Canada, for her to be able to get maternity, she would have had to work until May so she could go off maternity and still get paid half her salary from her job. So mm -hmm. we still needed, obviously we needed income. And then I actually, again, backtracking a little bit for what you want to do and I can't play soccer forever um, once as an athlete you, once you get older you get a little bit slower you're not as fit and and then young kids take over that's that's just the way it is right but again uh, over that year um, I was like okay we'll wait until May and then the the transfer window in the UK opens around June time. So I'll go back in May, or sorry, we'll, we'll go back in May and then I'll play for a team in the UK because the Canadian Premier League wasn't starting until April 2019. So it was still another year and a bit until it came. So again, I had to plan ahead and think of what, what we can do and that was our plan. But then uh, I was like, okay, what do I want to do after soccer? You know, it's a good time. I've got some time here to study or to do some qualifications, whatever it is. And I'm like, okay, I want to stay in soccer. I want to become a, a coach. But again, I need to get my coaching qualifications. So I ended up going back to Belfast in May, left my wife in Canada while she was pregnant. Um, and then the plan was start my coaching two weeks. It was, so you're there for two weeks and then the rest of it is online until you've got to go back the following year and do your assessments. Right. Um, and while I was there, my wife had to go in the hospital. She had a, a blood condition where she was unable to fly. So the plan was for me to go over there to Belfast, sign for a team in Scotland or in, in Ireland or somewhere in England, and then phone my wife and say, hey, we're going to this place, and then fly back to Edmonton in Canada, get my wife, get our two dogs as well that we have and then fly back to wherever I was playing and have the baby, you know, have the baby there. Uh -huh. But once she went in the hospital, the doctor said, you're unable to fly, you know, with medical conditions. So that was that plan. Out. The plan was out the window. So again, it was, uh, I had to wait until the, our baby was born, which was the start of August. But again, I was 30, what I, 32 at the time. Yeah, so I, I just turned, I would have just turned 32 and I realized I had to stay fit. So anybody that knows Edmonton in January and February time, it's not a warm place. It's very, very cold. No. Yeah. Um, and it can get the minus 30 Celsius, which is, you know, you, you can't even be outside for five minutes. You know, so some days I, were, I, I was waiting in the house like, yeah, it's minus 10 Celsius and I can get out for a run. Uh, instead of running on the treadmill. Right. So again, mentally, it was very, very tough. I, I knew at my age, I couldn't take time off. It was very easy for me to say, okay, I'll put my feet up and watch Netflix all day. Um, or go and get a job in a grocery store. You know, it, it wasn't something that I wanted to do. And I'm humble enough to do it because I, I've worked, as I said, as a lifeguard in the past. But again, it was... I had to find something deep inside myself to push through it because I knew uh, whenever our baby was born and the opportunity, I knew the opportunity would have came along that I was ready for it. Um, because it, it, in soccer, if you're not fit and, and 
you know, you have no chance, basically. It doesn't matter how good you are right. because you need to run around the pits for 90 minutes. Um, so I had to be prepared and I had to be ready for the opportunity, the next opportunity that came along, uh, as well as mine and a newborn baby when he came. Right. So I, I want to pull out a few things from this just because I think this is significant. A lot of kids are, are stuck at home and we don't know what the future is going to hold just like you did in, in 2017, 2018. So what you did was you prepared for the future by staying fit and taking care of your physical body, which is really important. And then taking care of mentally looking for new opportunities. So you did your, your coaching and you worked towards that, towards getting your credentials and you're studying the game and you're learning. And I think that's something that any of us can do right now as we're sitting from home is we can take care of our physical bodies and then we can continue to learn and pursue our passions because as you were preparing for the future there in 2017, 2018, starting to make plans, a lot of kids can be doing the same thing now and thinking, what do I want to get at? good at? What do I want to develop? And so I think this is a really good model for us to follow is, you know, we can prepare. And then the, the good news is now you're back on a, a club team there in Canada. Yeah. You're playing professionally. Um, you know, this is your 16th year, so you've been playing a really long time. Uh, but you're better prepared now than perhaps you were even two or three years ago. So I, I think that's a great lesson uh, in, in what we can do when we're, we're stuck, right? Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to circle back. We talked earlier about Belfast and how things were challenging there. And I know that when you uh, met your wife and when you were thinking of starting a family, you decided to leave Ireland uh, for different kinds of opportunities and to avoid kind of the rough part of the upbringing you had. Can you talk about a little bit about that decision on why you decided to leave and, and what it's like now? You have a two-year-old, which I'm sure is a great adventure. What have you learned just being a new father? Um, yeah, again, our, our decision to move away from the belt from Belfast was just to uh, have a, a new life. Um, we felt, uh, I obviously, I, I bought an apartment in Belfast. We owned an apartment and we were actually settled there, but it was, it became a little bit stale. Um, I felt my life was just, it was going like this and I didn't want that. I wanted to reach higher, higher uh, avenues. And to do that, it was to move, move country, pack up everything, you know, sell, sell the apartment. And, and we ended up in Canada. Um, but the main thing was uh, we were married. And the next thing was obviously to start a family. And obviously your family, for me, family life becomes before your career. That's just me personally. Everybody's different. Um, but if you take, if, if you're happy in the family, then you're going to be better in your career. Personally, again, um, but we wanted to start a family and we wanted to raise our kids in a different culture. Um, because obviously growing up in Belfast, it was, there was a divide. Um, and I didn't want my kids to grow up having to choose sides, you know, and, and Coming to Canada, it's been great because I've obviously I've lived in Cincinnati as well. But uh, in Canada, you can go into a coffee shop, and there there may be six or seven different people, different color, different race, different beliefs, and everybody just talk to each other normal. Uh, they put they put their differences aside and enjoy a coffee. The, the, the well or whatever it is and that's what I me personally that's why we, we've decided to stay in Canada um, because obviously it, it, it's not all like that but again um, I didn't want my my two-year-old son now and if we have any more kids I didn't want them growing up having to eat, hate other people or be stuck in a side because we're all human beings at the end of the day we all have brains we all have a love for certain things and we all want to be successful, have good friends and things like that. Um, you know, so for me and my, my wife personally, that was our decision to move across. Um, you know, it could have been Australia, it could have been Amer America. Um, it was Canada because uh, that was the team who wanted me to sign for. And I done well there. I was there long enough. 
in Edmonton to be able to get my Canadian permanent residency. Now, if I had been in Cincinnati for longer, I might have been able to get a green card, you know, to stay, stay in America um, and again in Australia. But that was our, you know, it wasn't, it was scary moving, you know, uh, but, and I've moved, we've moved, what, maybe four or five times since. Um, and every time, you know, it's when you see your bags, your suitcase is packed and you've sold all your furniture and there's nothing in the house. You know, you do get a little bit anxious and, and you're worried about, you know, have I made the right decision? But again, once you calculate things and you decide, you feel it in your gut, it's the right thing to do. You know, just believe in yourself and go for it. Uh, and again, me and my wife, we support each other very well. Uh, and again, in February, we moved from Ireland over to Winnipeg. You know, we traveled. We packed everything up and traveled. It took us a full day. It was tough, but now I'm in my, my place in Winnipeg. My wife, we're happy. Uh, and again, all the hard work that I've put in, it, it pays off all the time. You know, you, you put the groundwork in. Um, and again, obviously COVID has been about, and I was here for a month, and then I was on lockdown in a new city with my wife. And I'm like, my, my son couldn't go to daycare. My wife couldn't go to work. We're stuck in our apartment. Um, what do you do? Uh, and, and the same for everybody around the world. And again, as I've always done, I went back and invested in myself, invested in my own career. I think I read maybe three or four different books at the time. Right now, I'm trying to actually uh, build my own website um, regarding sports and things like that. So I've done a lot of research in how websites work, how all that sort of thing works and then who to speak to. So plus I, I had to finish off a lot of coaching stuff online. But again, in, in, if you've got time, you know, time is so precious. Whenever you're young, you don't think about it too much. But as you know, when we get a little bit older, you know, especially when you have kids, the, the, the time in the day, there's not enough time in the day. Whereas whenever I was 13, 14 as a teenager, I remember sitting in the bedroom, like uh, playing the PlayStation, and, and, and time couldn't go slow. It was so slow. But then, when you, you get in, whenever you finish school and you're thrown into the big world and you got to work for a living, you know, time goes really quick. But again, if you invest in yourself, um, you be humble, be nice, and, you know, you know socialize with people. It's like we, you contacted me on LinkedIn a few days ago and, and we're here talking. Right. Um, you know, so be open to things. Um, don't shut things down and and try and, if you're speaking to people, try and see it from their perspective because you'll, you will learn an absolute a lot from uh, looking at other people's perspective um, instead of, as they say, having the blinkers on and, and having tunnel vision. Right. Um, look at what's going around you and things and, and you will grow as a person. No doubt about it. Yeah, well, I, I, I've sure learned a lot just from listening to you for this last little bit. I really appreciate you coming on the show today, Daryl, and sharing part of your story, but also just the, the historical perspectives. I think this is really going to help a lot of students out just to see that, you know, the world is full of strife. It's full of different ideas, and we need to be understanding. We need to be good people, as you mentioned. You know, we need to decide that we want to be good people. And so I, I love your message. I, I wish you all the best of luck at, with the new season. And uh, thanks for being on the show today. Thank you, Tyler. And I want to wish everyone good luck and uh, good luck for the future, really. Right. Cool.